Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon, I should say. <coughs> I am very excited to be here to talk to my comrade and teacher and brilliant scholar and activist, Harsha Walia. Uh, just to give you some background, um, she is currently executive director of the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association. Um, she's a longtime activist. I mean, known, um, uh, I mean, every single state institution in, in uh, Canada is afraid of her, I'm sure. Uh, in 2001, she co-founded No One Is Illegal uh, and worked with a lot of organizations um, uh, supporting groups like I Don't Know More, the Defenders of the Land Network, uh, South Asian Network for Secularism and Democracy. Uh, she has a law degree from <coughs> British Columbia Law School and is the author of one of my favorite books uh, that I've taught before, uh, Undoing Border Imperialism. And she's also co-author of Never Home, Legislating Discrimination in Canadian Immigration, as well as Red Women Rising, Indigenous Women Survivors in Vancouver's Downtown uh, East Side. Of course, we're here to talk about her new book, Building in Rule, Global Migration, Capitalism, and the Rise of Racist Nationalism. So welcome. Aisha, you there? Okay, great. Hi. Hi, so I'm glad you're here. Um, I'm going to just say a few words about the book. For, first of all, <coughs> there's no reason for anyone on this call not to actually have the book already. Um, you can purchase it from Haymarket. You can download a, um, uh, 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 a Kindle version of it. Um, let me say a couple words about it. It's an or extraordinary book in so many ways uh, that even extends beyond the, the borders of its own subtitle. Um, it is about borders as expressions of domination, class rule, as manifestations of colonialism and racial capitalism, and, and also borders as necessary for the reproduction of those uh, modes of power. Um, and by border, uh, she doesn't mean just walls, you know, but she talks about four primary modes of governance, exclusion, territorial diffusion, commodified inclusion, and discursive control. Um, the most important takeaway for me <coughs> is that when you look outside of the borders of, say, the United States, which is where so much of political discourse seems to be locked right now, um, and you start to look outside of even the, the boundaries, the temporal boundaries of the 20th century, uh, you begin to realize that what we're facing is not, uh, as liberals and the right agree, a border crisis, but rather a displacement crisis. Um, and just to quote, she writes, border crises are not merely domestic issues to be managed through policy reform. They must instead be placed within globalized asymmetries of power inscribed by race, caste, class, gender, sexuality, and abil ability and nationality, creating migration and restricting mobility. So having said that, um, I wanna open up our conversation <clears throat> first by talking about the moment that we're in. Uh, so Harsh, I saw your uh, outstanding piece in The Intercept um, uh, that draws from the book that talks about the Biden administration's immigration policy uh, and, you know, the lessons that we can draw from the Democratic Party's record. Uh, and, of course, we're, we've just witnessed, you know, like a whole slew of deportations under Biden-Harris. Uh, most recently, just a couple of days ago, where uh, a number of um, people were picked up and deported to Haiti, many of whom were children. Um, and here we are where liberals are breathing, thinking they're breathing a sigh of relief. And when stuff like this happens, their response is, oh, well, are there rogue forces in ICE? You know, and as you know, um, you, your work, groups like Black Alliance for Just Immigration and Mejente uh, are not fooled by this. So since we're not fooled, 
tell us what we need to know. What do we need to know about uh, the current uh, democratic um, regime, the Biden infrastructure, and what it means in the struggle um, for migrant justice and to end this kind of violence? Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for being in conversation. It's it's truly an honor um, to be in conversation with you uh, and to have you your words in the forward of this book. Um, so thank you. There's a lot more I can and want to say, but um, just my deepest gratitude and, and respect for all of your work that has been so inspiring and pivotal for me and I know so many others as well. Um, I just want to start quickly by saying that I'm on the lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. These are the indigenous nations who continue to affirm their sovereignty and their jurisdiction and their laws on these lands. Um, and for me, as someone who's involved in, in migrant justice work and to think about you know, this current moment um, is to destabilize uh, primarily the ways in which we understand the settler colonial state. Um, and to instead affirm other kinds of jurisdiction and other laws and other ways of, of being and understanding a nationhood. So that is always, I think, part of our work, um, whether it's under uh, Trump or whether it's under, under Biden um, and a necessary part of how we think through uh, the role of borders. Um, and as you as you said, Robin, you know this the the beginning of the Biden administration has already been marked by a number of of deportations, and you know yet the kind of focus of these deportations has been on ICE and only on ICE, and the narrative has been that ICE has gone rogue, uh, which really is you know that's inaccurate for for two reasons I think one is that it. Um, it really erases and obscures that that is in fact the role of ICE. <laughs> ICE has not gone rogue. ICE is doing what ICE does, which is to detain and deport people. Um, and the other is that, of course, it really lets the Biden administration off the hook, right? So even though a federal a judge in Texas temporarily blocked Biden's pause on you know, his deportation moratorium, uh, nothing about that court order suggested that the Biden administration needed to proceed with deportations. Um, and, you know, as, as you mentioned, organizers on the ground, like the Black Alliance for Just Immigration and Mi Gente and others have been very clear and swift in, you know, blasting Biden's refusal to intervene and to stop ICE because he absolutely could have done more. And, you know, the, the deportations that have been happening, you know, to Jamaica, to Guatemala, to Honduras, to Haiti. Um, and, you know, important here to note that the deportations uh, that were happening to Haiti are happening as as popular uprisings in Haiti are currently happening, right, are currently unfolding against U.S.-backed uh, dictatorships continuously propped up in the long arc of U.S. imperialism in Haiti. Um, and so I think what this this moment tells us and why it's important is that we we cannot separate the Democratic Party from the violence of ICE. And we cannot ignore the ways in which the Democratic Party has absolutely been central to shaping U.S. border policy, right? Like Trump didn't build up ICE overnight. Trump didn't build the border wall overnight. There is a long record that we must refuse to sanitize when we're thinking about um, what it means to be under the Biden administration. And I would argue that there's a, a few things that we can learn um, from the Democratic Party's, you know, shamefully violent record. Um, and one is that the ways in which the Democratic Party has been so good in so many different spaces, but, you know, especially on the kind of Im immigration portfolio, if you will, in really dividing and ruling the movement um, and really creating these kind of neoliberal concessions of who is the quote unquote good, productive, legal immigrant who will get to stay and under what conditions. And conversely, who is the quote unquote criminal, illegal, bad immigrant who will be deported, right? And really forcing these kinds of concessions. Um, and the second thing that I would argue has been really pivotal to the Democratic Party's record is the outsourcing of border enforcement. Um, and they have been pivotal in doing this, right? So while Trump builds up the symbolic wall, um, I would argue that, you know, it really was Obama who perfected the outsourcing of border enforcement. So we don't even have to see border enforcement at the wall. We just we see it elsewhere. Um, and so, you know, just going through, you know, the Clinton years briefly, the Clinton years really uh, 
normalized the most severe consequences of border militarization and mass detention. And, you know, in 1994, as Clinton was signing the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, and, you know, NAFTA is still to this day the world's largest free trade agreement. It's not the only one. There's 600 other free trade agreements that, you know, uh, ensure the free movement of capital, our, our trade agreements of dispossession and neoliberal extraction. Um, and we know that 1994, as NAFTA was signed, is also an important date because that was the date that the Zapatistas rose up in global rebellion. Uh, because they knew what NAFTA would mean uh, across Mexico, but especially for indigenous nations and lands and communities in Mexico. Um, and so, the, you know, 1994 is important for so many reasons. It marked the beginning of what we know as the current iteration of the global justice movement against uh, neoliberal capitalist globalization. It marked the signing of NAFTA. And it also marked, uh, lesser known, um, the time when the Army Corps of Engineers in the United States started fencing the border. Uh, to constrict the movement of the very same people who were going to be displaced by NAFTA, right? And that, to me, is uh, it's so crucial to understand because whenever we hear politicians say, oh, you know, neoliberalism and free trade and the global south will lift people up out of poverty, well then, why are you fencing the border at the exact same time, <laughs> right? It's because you actually know. Um, and we know that the U.S. state government predicted that this kind of mass impoverishment, displacement, and consequently migration would be taking place as a result of NAFTA. Um, and so, you know, under Clinton, we saw the Border Patrol triple in size. It became the second largest law enforcement agency at the time. And there was operations, you know, throughout, uh, you know, Texas and California, Arizona, we had operations like Safeguard, Gatekeeper, Hold the Line, all of these which militarized the border under the 1994 official strategy of prevention through deterrence. And prevention through deterrence is a very sanitized way of talking about border killings, right? Like the deterrence is death. That's what the deterrence is supposed to be. Um, and we still talk about border deaths in this very passive way that I find deeply disturbing. Um, you know, often victim blaming, right? Like why did we, you know, media will often ask, corporate media will often ask, why are migrants um, on the move? Why are they taking these dangerous journeys? But we have to remember there is nothing inherently dangerous about people migrating. Migration has become dangerous. It has been made dangerous as a result of state policies to kill people, right? In the hopes that border killings will deter people, um, like the strategy of prevention through deterrence. And so, you know, expectedly, border deaths, border killings have been going up um, every year since 1994. And the other thing that Clinton did was merge his kind of tough on immigration strategy and border militarization with tough on crime, right? And so we know Clinton was notorious for the crime laws that he passed in the United States, the 1994 crime laws, which vastly expanded police and prisons. Um, but also the way, you know, the 1994 crime laws that most people know about, they also converged with Clinton's 1996 immigration laws. And what these laws did in tandem was to basically mobilize the rhetoric of crime, drugs, and illegals to expand the category of aggravated felony convictions and va like vastly widen the net for deportation and detention of legal permanent residents with minor convictions stemming from the stop and frisk policing and the war on drugs, right? So basically what we had within a few years uh, was just the average daily detentions tripling and deportations uh, averaging 150,000 annually. Um, and this is something that we saw under Obama as well, right? So Obama, when he passed DACA, uh, you know, the much lauded DACA, and we've heard, you know, Biden is going to bring back DACA protections. But at the same time uh, that, that Obama was signaling um, his implementation of DACA, he made this infamous statement where he said, felons, not families, criminals, not children, gang members, not a mom who's working hard to provide for her kids, right? Signaling that as he was signing DACA, he was going to start to increase enforcement against people with criminal records, right? Basically. And again, this convergence of, you know, the tough on crime and the tough on immigration kind of agenda under the Democrats. And Obama turbocharged the Secure Communities Initiative, um, until 2014. And we continue to see this in various forms. Under Clinton, it was, you know, and it continues today, the criminal alien program. We have the Secures Community Initiatives, but various kinds of initiatives that basically 
uh, connect local law enforcement to ICE, right? And so that becomes a pipeline for expulsion that predictably overwhelmingly targets black folks, targets Afro-Latinx migrants, targets migrants from the Caribbean. So this disproportionate targeting um, of, uh, of, certain, of certain migrants over others, right? Because we have this connection between the anti-black criminal justice system uh, and, and immigration uh, and this new kind of uh, form of immigration that's dependent on the tough on crime. And so at the same time, under Clinton and Obama, while we have this convergence between tough on crime and tough on immigration, we also have the massive expansion, of course, of the prison industrial complex, right? And this then is paralleled by the rise in the massive explosion of the immigration detention system. Um, and so these are both happening at the same time. Um, and so now the U.S. has, you know, the, the shameful honor of, you know, both being the country with the largest incarceration rate in the world and also the largest system of immigration detention in the world. So these also work together in the ways in which, you know, carceral regimes are intended to immobilize people, uh, to control surplus populations. Um, and really, I think one thing that has that stood out to me in the writing of this book was, you know, reading a piece that traces uh, the kind of lineage of the word mob. And the word mob, which we know is a kind of criminalizing vocabulary used to link large groups of racialized people to social disorder in inner cities uh, and also at the border, right? The idea of like mobs at the border or mobs in the streets, it actually derives from the word mobility. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's so crucial to remember when we're thinking about the ways in which police and prisons and borders and all carceral regimes work is that they work through the spatial logic of immobilization. Um, and so, you know, one of the arguments that I that I make in the book um, is that, and you know, and here drawing from Angela Davis and Gina Dent, who wrote in the early 2000s, we continue to find that the prison is a border, right? So this is what they wrote in 2001. Uh, we continue to find that the prison is itself a border. Um, and I think we can extend that and draw from Angela Davis and Gina Dent in saying that the prison is a border and the border is a prison, right? That is what the border is intended to do. It's intended to capture and, and contain people. And that really, again, this was this was perfected under, under the Democrats. Um, the last thing that I'll, I'll say quickly about the Democratic record uh, is really just the ways in which they have expanded border outsourcing. And I know Robin will, will talk about this a bit later, so I won't say too much about it now, um, other than to say it's so important that, you know, as we are um, horrified, legitimately so, by immigration raids and detention centers within the U.S., we have to understand and see the ways in which border outsourcing is increasingly the method of border enforcement that states, including the United States, are undertaking around the world, right? So it's not just about the border. It's not just about the U.S.-Mexico southern border or the border wall. It's about pushing border enforcement out into other countries. Um, and, you know, the, the United States infamously declared, uh, DHS officials infamously declared that the Guatemalan border with Chiapas is now our southern border. So we have a battery of migration and border and police checkpoints that extend all the way from Guatemala into Mexico to the southern U.S. border. And we saw that under the first few days of the Biden administration, uh, thousands of migrants from Honduras who were headed towards the United States were blockaded and tear gassed by Guatemalan soldiers and police, right? And the United States has for many years, and especially expanded under, under President Barack Obama, um, has vastly increased funding and training of border enforcement all throughout Mexico and Central America to prevent migrants and refugees from even making it to the U.S.-Mexico border, right? And so these are the things that I think we need to keep in mind is the ways in which the Biden administration will uh, divide and conquer movements or attempt to do so by creating categories of good versus bad migrant, um, creating categories of, you know, the innocent or the good migrant, which really is reliance on white supremacy and cis heteronormativity and these ideas, the social hierarchies of, you know, who's desirable and who's not. Uh, and will also basically outsource the violence of, of border enforcement the ways that Clinton and Obama did. So not a huge leap from Trump standing there saying, you know, Mexico sends its worst people, <laughs> you know. Um, I want to go back to 
well, a couple things. Just there's so much in 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 what you just said is so rich. I was thinking about um, a line from your book where you write, "Immigration detention is a race making regime, synchronized through the intertwined dynamics." of global imperialism and domestic war. <clears throat> and I was thinking about how, you know, the story that you told about the Clinton and Obama years extend way back. Of course, we're gonna go way, way back to center colonialism, but even if you just go back to the 1980s, and one of the points that you make <coughs> is that you, you show how a lot of the policies around asylum seekers that we were so, you know, apoplectic about, you know, when, we saw it under Trump, go back to like US deterrence, you know, again, uh, global imperialism, domestic warfare, uh, where the idea is that in the 1980s, you know, we talk about Haiti, for example, um, where they were trying to prevent uh, asylum seekers specifically from Haiti and, and Cuba. Uh, and the US Cold War response to Caribbean migrations really established um, the kind of structure for the kind of migration yeah. detention and border deterrence regime that that you write so beautifully about. And that goes back, you can see that in the Carter administration, certainly in Reagan, but you see it in the Carter administration. So in other words, it's been... Sorry, that was a mistake. Uh, okay, um, I don't know what I said. So um, I just want to go back and and ask you about uh, U.S. border formation, and you know, could you give this amazing capsule history <coughs> at the beginning of the book, where you know you you demonstrate what is, you know, which should be obvious, but it's not always obvious that, you know, the real crisis of displacement begins with settler colonialism, uh, with no one's talking about all these people coming out of Europe, you know, whether they're the best of the Europeans <laughs> or not, settling around, displacing, killing, murder, engaged in genocide, uh, slavery, all that. Um, and that is the history. And that history of violent settler colonialism and expansion and displacement also connects the struggles, anti-imperialist struggles, um, struggles for indigenous sovereignty. Um, you know, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, and I'm wondering uh, specifically, you know, how do we think about and the, the, what you talk about, which is the way that these struggles are interwoven because this is the history that produced it. Uh, and, and how can we talk about that in an era where increasingly these struggles are seen as not only separate, but often antagonistic? I mean, the language of race war is coming back with a vengeance, and it's just useless for understanding what uh, what's happening and what needs to be done. So can you sort of take us back to that history um, and, and what the implications are for the formation of kind of interconnected struggles for freedom, abolition, and decolonization. Sure. Thank you for that <laughs> that big small question. Um, and I, I'll try to be brief. Um, I realize, sorry, I answered that first question uh, in a lot in a lot of time. Um, but I uh, I think exactly as as you said, Robin. You know, one of the things that I think is the most um, insidious, if that's the word, about the ways in which the current quote-unquote migration crisis as we've come to know it, what is so insidious about that uh, framework is just how ahistorical it is, right? Because we're suddenly uh, worried and up in arms, and by we I mean, you know, the, the state, the, the border, you know, the border panic, the state panic. Um, and, you know, what is so ahistoric about that is that the migration crisis is presented as a new sort of crisis uh, with primarily Western states positioned as its victims, <laughs> um, when, you know, which completely erases the ways in which the, the mass, uh, largely forced movement and displacement of peoples has 
underwritten our history, whether we're looking at the indentureship of millions of Asians across the continents and across the world, whether we're looking at the forced and violent enslavement of people of African descent across the world. Um, and then parallel to that, the free movement, the colonial movement of settler colonists across the Americas and the Oceania, right? So the ways in which the asymmetry of movement has always been part of our history. Um, and in fact, has, is the condition of possibility for the West to exist, right? That is its very condition of possibility. Um, and in, in the U.S. context, um, you know, in the contemporary era, we often think of the southern U.S.-Mexico border um, specifically, which, you know, and again, I, I do talk about, um, and thank you for, for mentioning that, Robin, about the ways in which the maritime border of the U.S. is often not talked about, even though it's the maritime border of the U.S. with Haiti in particular that really built up uh, the inland detention regime of the United States. Uh, but given the, the focus on the southern U.S.-Mexico border, the land border, and even within that, the focus is often on how the border is like a racist weapon to exclude migrants and refugees, right? So again, um, the ways in which the border uh, is, a, is a, a method of detention, of deportation, um, and exclusion. But I think uh, that's where history is instructive and certainly was instructive for me, uh, which is that, you know, the U.S., Mexico border, the southern border was foundationally organized and is like therefore completely inseparable uh, from imperialist expansion, from indigenous elimination and anti-black enslavement, right? And so it's this concurrent, these concurrent processes actually solidified the border in order to make the border uh, a method of racial exclusion and migrant exclusion, right? It was, it was through these other kind of former processes. Um, and, you know, this, this, this happens in in a in a number of ways, but I'll I'll just I'll do it briefly. Um, you know, first, if we're thinking about imperialist expansion, of course, you know the entire uh, capture of territories claimed by Mexico is the most obvious way in which we can analyze and think through this, right? So, in 1950, uh, the fact that the U.S. seized more than 500,000 square miles of territory claimed by Mexico and completely shifted the border south. Um, and this is, of course, you know, including uh, the seizure and annexation of indigenous nations and indigenous lands who were then forcibly assimilated into the U.S. nation state. Right. So the kind of frontier, the frontier logic of the U.S. is, is constantly expanding. Um, and, and, you know, what's really uh, important to remember here, of course, is, you know, as uh, that one of the, the backdrops and the, the key context for. Uh, the U.S. to um, to launch its prolonged military invasion of, of Mexico uh, was really this white settler Texian secessionist movement, right? That was, uh, you know, when in 1837, Jackson officially recognized the independent Republic of Texas. This was, a, this was you know, pertinent because Texians affirmed slavery uh, and free black people required special permission to live in Texas. Right. And so the, the U.S. military invasion of Mexico and then the imposition of the treaty in 1848 was completely bound up in settler colonialism and enslavement and the frontier, the frontier mentality of, of imperialism. Um, and, at, you know, at the same time uh, uh, of, you know, 1848, 1850 is when black people were subjected then to the Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, and a big part of the kind of rationale of the Fugitive Slave Act was to prevent um, non-enslaved black people from escaping into Mexico. So the border was not only a method of preventing Mexican migration into the United States, it was also serving the function of preventing in formerly enslaved and or non-enslaved black people from escaping into Mexico, right? So it was, it was again, you know, the border was acting as a prison. Um, in order to capture and, and contain free black movement. Um, and, you know, with respect to the ways in which indigenous communities were simultaneously, you know, captured by the border and by the ways in which immigration and citizenship regimes kind of worked. Um, you know, the first is, of course, that we have to recognize that settler colonialism 
is a form of imperialism, right? We tend to think of indigenous nations in this kind of domesticated uh, framework, right? Where we, where we obscure uh, the reality of indigenous liberation um, as an anti-imperialist struggle. Um, and then also, you know, one of the ways in which immigration uh, and, and citizenship was specifically weaponized to further indigenous genocide was that the Indian Citizenship Act was imposed on indigenous people in 1924, right? So indigenous people had to become US citizens as a form of settler colonialism. And the other thing that happened just prior to that under the Dawes Act was that one of the ways in which indigenous peoples were forced to relinquish collective land title, communal land title, and communal social legal organization and was to assimilate into the capitalist economy of the white settler state, right, of like fee simple property and citizenship. And so it was through uh, indigenous, through the capture, the attempted capture of indigenous jurisdiction that citizenship even became, um, it became this kind of um, pillar of settler colonialism that we now know it to be, right, where you know, free that where settlers could get free land, <laughs> where settlers could own property as private property, um, and where white settlers and and others enslaved black people, right? And so the border was was key in this kind of formation. And the other thing that the that the border really enacted against indigenous peoples was it um, it treated indigenous peoples who were looking to move across the U.S.-Mexico border, as well as the Canada-U.S. border, it criminalized them. So Crees and Chippewas from, from Canada, for example, and Yaquis from Mexico who were crossing and going back and forth into now what was known as the United States were actually treated as deportable illegal immigrants, right? And we continue to see this today with the U.S.-Mexico border and the U.S.-Canada border um, being an act of warfare on indigenous communities whose land is now spliced apart, cut open um, by this fake border, right? Uh, and, and of course, so many indigenous nations who have stood up um, and really are the front line of opposing border militarization because it cuts into the hearts of their nations and their communities and their lands. And so, you know, if we, if we look at... Um, at border formation, I think, you know, through the ways in which the border really was an act of imperialism and annexation, uh, was attempts to control free black movement, uh, really was to contain indigenous peoples and annex indigenous nations, we start to see that the border is a method of a number of forms of interconnected violences. Um, it's, it's a form of imperialism, it's a form of elimination, it's a form of enslavement, and it is also a form of migrant exclusion, and that we can't ignore these entanglements. And of course, we see this in the contemporary era in a number of different ways, including the fact that when we think of migrant, we often um, don't think of indigenous and black peoples as migrants, when in fact we know uh, that migrants are not only, you know, in the U.S. context, for example, Latinx peoples, but that it includes indigenous peoples, that the vast number of indigenous people or the vast number of migrants that are coming uh, from Central America, for example, are indigenous peoples who are caught between, as Shannon Speed calls it, the settler states, um, by Latin, caught between Latin American and Anglo-American settler states. And of course, um, African and Caribbean migrants who are coming into the United States and are disproportionately impacted by policies of detention and deportation, right? And that and that capture. And so I think in these ways we can see these, as you said so perfectly, not as you know, siloed issues, but as necessary entanglements of, of violence um, that rely on each other, right? That rely on the expansion of the carceral state, that rely on indigenous genocide, that rely on anti-black violence, and that rely on the, the continued idea of the US as a as a kind of frontier. No, speaking of frontier, this is probably a good time to to talk about the outsourcing of border enforcement, um, because you know so far we've talked about mostly North America or the Americas, uh, but you talk about this globally. You talk about um, the sort of immigration border enforcement uh, structures um, affecting Australia, uh, Europe, um, Asia. I mean, there's a there's it's almost like the borders, multiple, which are all interconnected, are finding locations of policing uh, around the globe 
And can you talk about that, and spe- especially in terms of, of, you know, the outsourcing of border enforcement? You already talked about Guatemala, but in the global south and, and how frontiers of border militarization, you know, are shifting out and shaping the character uh, of imperial power. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think, um, thank you for that, because that's uh, that's top of my mind <laughs> these days. And I think, you know, either we tend not to talk about the relationship between imperialism and migration, or if we do, uh, we tend to talk about the relationship between imperialism and migration as one of like cause and effect, right? So for example, we may name the long arc of, you know, U.S. dirty imperialist coups and U.S.-backed dictators, you know, capitalist trade agreements or, you know, U.S.-driven climate change as all causing displacement and migration. And, you know, we can trace this back to the U.S. death squads in Guatemala, the Contra Wars against the Sandinistas, NAFTA and other trade agreements, you know, NAFTA in Mexico, what's called CAFTA-DR, the Central American Free Trade Agreement and with the Dominican Republic in Central America, you know, the never-ending war on drugs, the war on terror, um, or again, you know, the long arm of imperialist interference in Haiti since Papa Doc till, till today. Um, and, you know, this is often the context in which we we talk about the, the connection between imperialism and migration, right? Um, but uh, what I think, um, what we often miss when we only talk about imperialism as a driver of migration is that we miss how imperial... Uh, imperial relations are are currently being made through the outsourcing of mar- of, of border enforcement, right? So, um, what I argue in the book, and of course others have argued as well, which is that outsourcing border in, in, outsourcing borders and outsourcing border enforcement is becoming a central method of preserving imperialism, right? So those who who like to argue that imperialism is like you know uh, is is no longer in fashion, <laughs> um, or that imperialism no longer exists, I think you know missed the mark for uh, a number of reasons, but really missed the mark in not looking at the ways in which border enforcement is becoming a central pillar uh, in the maintenance of imperialism today. Um, and we see this in, in a number of different scenarios. And in the book, I, I look specifically at Australia and Europe, uh, but kind of, you know, zooming out in U.S., Australian and European subordination of Central America, Oceania, Africa and the Middle East compels countries in these regions to accept offshore detention, migration checkpoints, migration prevention campaigns, all as conditions of trade and aid agreements. Right. So. The new frontiers of, of border militarization is countries in the global south. It's countries like Libya, like Mali, like Mexico, like Nairu, like Niger, like Papua New Guinea, like Turkey, like Sudan, who've really become the frontiers of Western border militarization. And migrants and refugees become bargaining chips, right, within these within these global relations. So like for Erdogan in Turkey or Gaddafi in Libya or Hamedi in Sudan, you know, these are, are authoritarian dictators who are propped up by Western countries for one of the key reasons in order to prevent migration, right? So border outsourcing, um, I argue, is a, is a method of imperialism in our contemporary era. And we cannot ignore this reality. Um, and Australia is really a driver of, of border outsourcing enforcement policies, as is, as is Europe. Um, I mean, the U.S., of course, uh, has its own um, outsourcing that we touched on briefly. Um, but I think Australia and Europe are important uh, for people to understand because they've really been doing this for a really long time. Um, and, you know, as a settler colonial state, Australia has a history of exporting some of the most durable forms of state violence, but it really doesn't get a lot of attention in our analysis. Um, and in the formal kind of British colonial era, it was in the colony of Australia that the torrent system of land registration was developed that was later exported across the British Empire. Uh, and this was, you know, basically the private property regime for land ownership as we now know it. And, you know, this is, the system was uh, borrowed from slave ship manifest, Renissa Mawani traces this, and it seized land from indigenous legal organizations and converted it into the mass system of white settler private property ownership and registration that we know today. And it was also under the slogan of white Australia 
that Australia enacted the first anti-Chinese legislation in the British colonial world that became a template for the U.S. and Canada to, to implement their own versions of these policies in the late 1800s, right? So I mentioned this briefly because I think this history is, in, is instructive in understanding Australia's contemporary border regime, which is one of the most sophisticated and violent systems of offshore detention in the world. And so Australian offshore detention basically means Australian funded detention centers that are not on in, or that are not in the Australian mainland. They're on Manu Island in Papua New Guinea, in the Republic of Nauru, and the Australian Overseas Territory of Christmas Island. And so what this does is create a completely outsourced regime of border detention and immigration enforcement. Um, and that, that has bipartisan support from the Australian Labour Party and the Conservative Liberal Party um, in Australia. And, you know, these these offshore detention centers are called prison camps by the thousands of detainees who are incarcerated in them. And they've been sites of some of the world's most prolonged and inspiring resistance. Um, and, you know, Behruz Buchani, I'll just mention him briefly. He's a Kurdish refugee from Iran. And he wrote a book from Manu Island that's called No Friend But the Mountains. And he wrote the entire book, one text message at a time, while he was detained using a smuggled cell phone. Um, and, you know, Beruz and thousands of other detainees who are detained in Manu prison in Papua New Guinea, um, you know, they're, they're subjected to Australian detention policies, right? Even though this detention center is in Papua New Guinea, it is an Australia, it is Australian immigration policy that is being enforced. And they're patrolled by Papua New Guinea's notorious paramilitary police squad that is partially funded by the Australian Immigration Department, right? So this is how the carceral systems and carceral regimes in Papua New Guinea are funded. And so, you know, while while Beruz was detained in Australia, or detained by Australia, rather, in Manu Prison, he actually won Australia's most eminent literary prize in January 2019, two years ago. But Australia wouldn't even release him to accept the prize, right? It's like the cruelties of neoliberal fame. Like, you write this book, it becomes a bestseller, and everyone's like, oh, you know, he wrote a book while in detention, and he can't even accept the prize because he's still detained, right? And so this is, this is like peak settler neoliberalism for me. Um, and, you know, and why, that, why offshore detention is particularly important to understand is not only because it's the offshoring or the outsourcing of border enforcement, but because it, it continues imperial rule, right? So Papua New Guinea and Nauru are, for folks who are not familiar, are island nations in the Oceania who, that have been under explicit Australian imperial rule for the past century. And until, you know, in the case of Papua New Guinea, until 1975, Papua New Guinea was under Australian colonial rule, as well as what was called a UN trusteeship agreement, where Australia administered Papua New Guinea. And that was the same for Nauru. Nauru was under a UN Australian administrative and trusteeship, like just so much paternalistic colonialism there, um, until 1968. And so, you know, here I think we can think about Edward Said when he said that, quote, imperialism lingers where it has always been, right? Imperialism lingers where it has always been. And countries like Nauru and Papua New Guinea are now offered, or we could say, you know, are being coerced to accept Australia's outsourced detention regime in exchange for aid money. And so, you know, these countries that have been subjected to a long, long decades of resource colonialism, ecological devastation, and forced dependency are now being forced to become Australian, Australian penal colonies, right? That's what they've been forced to become. Um, and in you know the early 2000s, when Australia first started offshoring detention and forcing Nairu to accept refugees, Australia increased aid to Nairu that amounted to one third of the country's GDP. One third of the country's GDP. And so Australia presents offshore detention as a kind of like economic partnership between sovereign countries, right? But in fact, Australian aid to countries like Papua New Guinea and Nairu, also increasingly to Indonesia, is a bargaining chip. It's a bargaining chip to maintain imperial relations and to outsource Australia's border policies. And so I think, you know, this is so crucial to understand because the soft power of immigration diplomacy is like a central pillar in the maintenance of our colonial present, right? And in, in Fortress Europe, I'll mention briefly, like, you know, Fortress Europe is, is a fortress 
that extends well beyond the borders of Europe, right? Countries across the Sahel region are being pressured to accept the outsourcing of EU borders, and most development, trade, and aid agreements now force African countries to implement migration controls. And some examples of this are, you know, the Khartoum process was established by the EU between the African Union Commission and the European Commission to quote unquote tackle migrations into Europe from Eritrea, Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Sudan. This was then followed by the Valletta Summit in 2015, which is an important year, right, because 2015 is the year where the EU declared the migration crisis um, and declared the refugee crisis, right? That was the, the big year for Europe. Um, and in the Khartoum process in 2015, African countries were promised financial resources in exchange for reducing migration to Europe. And the EU Emergency Trust Fund for Africa now diverts billions of euros earmarked for aid to African countries into surveillance and military equipment to prevent refugees from even leaving the continent through this Orwellian sounding program called Better Migration Management, right? So, um, you know, in response and in summary, the, the Pan-African Network in Defense of Migrant Rights summarizes these repressive policies as, quote, hunting policies for migrants that grow everywhere on the African continent with the support of European institutions under the Fortress Europe guise of the fight against irregular migration, end quote. And so I think, you know, we cannot think of the massive scale of, you know, Western Chinese and Indian land grabbing on the African continent, including in Cameroon, DRC, Ethiopia, Kenya, Madagascar, Mali, Senegal, Sudan, Tanzania, like all across the continent for cash crops and biofuel production. And we cannot think about the massive scale of the continued mass extraction of diamonds, oil, uranium, cobalt, coltan, and gold over blood batteries and blood diamonds. And we cannot think of the massive expansion of AFRICOM, right? AFRICOM is the US Africa Command, which is the US's most active US military command. We cannot think of all of those processes outside of the simultaneous expansion of imperialist bo militarized border enforcement that turns African countries into the border guards for Europe. Um, and I think this is this is so crucial to understand because you know when we when we hear about what's happening in Libya, for example, where you know anywhere from half a million to one million migrants uh, are immobilized, 94 percent of who are from the African different African countries and from the continent. Um, and when we read these horrific stories, and you know, I won't, I won't focus on that, the spectacle of violence, but we've all likely seen the stories of what's unfolding, the horror of what's unfolding in Libyan detention centers. We have to remember that this is EU and Europe that has contributed to this terror, right? It is Europe that provides millions of euros to train the Libyan Coast Guard and that funds detention centers in Libya. And you know, Italian, the Italian former Italian Interior Minister Marco Minetti very blatantly said, securing Libya's southern border means securing Europe, right? And so that's this kind of offshoring that's happening um, in this massive scale, this massive scale of outsourcing border enforcement deep, deep into uh, the Sahel region, deep into the Middle East, um, that really makes it so crucial for us to understand how you know, two things. One is that borders are not fixed lines, right? Their borders are being produced and multiplying, as you said, Robin. Um, and the second is to understand how crucial it is to understand that border outsourcing um, is really cementing imperial relations and just globalizing, just rapidly globalizing the racial violence of detention and deportation. It's all here. <laughs> it's all here in this book. I mean, it's amazing thing is that what we talked about so far is still just a fraction of what's in the book. And I want to, um, I'm going to try to slip in some things. I want to make sure we get to some questions, then ask a sort of one final big question about kind of right and left wing xenophobia for that matter. But um, just, to, just to throw a few things on the table, I mean, this is also a book <coughs> about capitalism and labor. It's about, it is a global history of capital labor that's sort of, you know, kind of woven through because what is the migrant but labor, you know? And one of the points that you make so clearly is the ways in which um, uh, the, 
the, the the idea of the white working class as this kind of distinct category um, actually uh, is created at the expense of recognizing the class. That is to say that the idea that there's like national class, that there's a national working class, really erases the fact that there's a global working class in which, you know, borders actually facilitate the segmentation of that working class, um, facilitate the super exploitation of immigrant labor, and the majority of the class are uh, racialized, you know, uh, immigrant women of color, you know, racialized immigrant women. And this is what the class actually looks like. Um, and it's produced, you know, the border and everything you laid out, capital uh, produces that. And so we got to really think about what is the what is this working class? Um, because what ends up happening is you make this point very clearly that we end up falling into the trap of saying it's kind of politics of fear. You know, that it's the racism and xenophobia is kind of misdirected. As a po and, and then the flip side is that, oh, well, you know, the white working class, whatever it is, is just naturally racist because they're all anti-Black, which doesn't actually move us anywhere either. Um, and so I want to put that on the table there and also um, put one other thing on the table, which I want to say thank you for. And that is you talk about debt in this book. Debt is a key word. Uh, right now, at least in the U.S., there's all this talk about debt in terms of personal debt, student loan debt. A debt crisis becomes uh, the individual carrying debt in a larger debt regime. But what, what's been missing, or what, what actually was, I mean, I'm old enough to remember the days when, when you said debt, you're talking about sovereign debt. You're talking about global, the global South. You're talking about the way structural adjustment policies were imposed nations through debt leverage, which then produce this, you know, um, a, a population of displaced, displaced and migrant population. So I want to thank you for that. And I want to just lay that out there also, um, just for people to think about as they buy your book, as you're ordering it right now. Um, and I want to get to my question, <laughs> which <coughs> is the last part of the book is about the rise of racist nationalism, uh, right-wing nationalism, which you don't limit to the U.S. It's, you talk about it globally. You talk about Duterte. You talk about India. You talk, you know, um, India that had uh, the largest strike in human history, uh, you know, just, you know, and still ongoing a few months ago. So I want to hear you talk a little bit about, in some ways, how we got to this place um, you know, what your thoughts about uh, the rise of right wing nationalism, uh, how it in some ways is in concert with aspects of left wing nationalism, which is also pushing its own kind of anti immigrant uh, position uh, and uh, a kind of eco apartheid and, and eco fascism. These are all really critical moments that we're in, which some people are saying, well, that's the death of neoliberalism, but clearly not exactly. So what just, just if you could riff on just some of your thoughts about the rise of right-wing nationalism and racism, and then where do we go from here? Mm. Thanks, Robin. Um, yeah, I think, you know, maybe what I'll riff on is the, the left-wing nationalism piece of this, um, <laughs> because I think, you know, in terms of, of right wing and the rise of the right and the rise of right wing nationalism globally, um, you know, it becomes it's important, but it becomes easy to separate out the rise of Trump or Modi um, or Netanyahu or Duterte or, you know, and all the other kind of right wing leaders from the ways in which neoliberalism uh, has underpinned their rise. Right. And also the ways in which centrism uh, has really underwritten their rise. And I mean, there is, of course, a, a huge distinction between the rise of the right um, and the kind of more more subtle left wing nationalism. But um, maybe for the purposes of, of this conversation, where I think we're probably all on board with, uh, you know, denouncing right wing nationalism, maybe it's worth 
teasing out um, some of some of the uh, dangerous implications of of what we see in the left. Um, and you know, and I think here the the border and the ways in which the border works is is really instructive. Um, and you know, Robin, you you mentioned um, how one part of the book is is looking at uh, the ways in which the the border produces pliable labor, right? Um, and the, especially if we look at um, the regimes of temporary migrant workers, which are migrant workers who come under state programs like the H-2A program, the new kind of Bracero program in the United States, and really, again, globally, um, you know, what that tells us, and I think what that teaches us, is how central the border is to racial capitalism. Um, and, you know, here, of course, you know, we're all indebted to your work, Robin, and, you know, many others in, in thinking through racial capitalism uh, and thinking about how crucial it is to understand that racism underpins capitalism, right? That there is no capitalism that is not racial and that there is no meaningful anti-racism that is not also anti-capitalist, that we cannot separate out um, capitalism from racial dispossession. Um and, you know, borders really act as like a spatial fix for capitalism by creating an exploitable pool of labor, right? Um, the very kind of naming of migrant workers as migrants really kind of fractures um, the working class and fractures the class, as you said it. And, you know, the ways in which migrant workers operates, I think, is it's really just a euphemism for third world workers, right? <laughs> like when people are talking about migrant workers, they're just meaning to say third world workers. And they're talking about the workers that can't be outsourced, that that need to be insourced. They're the flip sides of the same kind of capitalist coin, right? The jobs that can't be outsourced are now being insourced. And this is basically deliberately deflated labor power. Um, and the denial of permanent immigration status and the racialization of migrant workers as quote unquote foreigners normalizes the racism, right? So they're, they're legal but deportable labor. Um, and I think this is important because the border does not only act to exclude and deport people, but it also acts to create the condition of deportability, right? Which is to say that you might be deported, but if you stay compliant, you will not be deported, right? And that really is, you know, again, looking at the at the Bracero program or the H-2 program or the H-2A program. Um, and in the U.S., you know, Thomas Friedman, um, who, you know, we'll all know is, is you know, uh, is basically a, a pro-democratic party commentator. Um, he wrote this op-ed and, you know, he said that the solution to the immigration crisis is, quote, a high wall with a big gate, but a smart gate. And the smart gate that Thomas Friedman and other neoliberals are talking about is they're talking about labor migration, right? They're talking about like, yeah, we, we can't, we don't need a wall. Like we can't block everybody. We just need to make sure that people are, are coming. They can stay legally, but we need to make sure that they're coming tied to an employer, right? They're coming tied in this kind of current day indentureship. Um, and these are, you know, these, this, and this is the ways in which I think the border is really crucial in, and plays a central pillar in modern day racial capitalism, right? Because the border acts as a spatial fix to capital accumulation. And it ensures that there's always a cheapened pool of labor, right? So it's, it's a key method of state violence and neoliberalism to collapse labor power and, and political power. Because we know that, you know, the way, kind of one of the key methods of union busting is to hold uh, workers kind of hostage to the threat of both termination and deportation, right? Like that's how these programs, these programs work. Um, and we saw that recently in the massive raids in Mississippi, right? Where 680 workers um, were raided in an ICE raid just after a very successful unionization drive and just coincidentally after they filed a lawsuit for discrimination and sexual harassment. And according to one study in the U.S., you know, 52 percent of companies in the U.S. threatened to call immigration authorities on workers during union drives. Right. So this is um, this is really crucial. It's a crucial method of accumulation and enacting and perpetuating racism. Right. As a, as a race making regime. And so here's where I think the kind of left nationalism um, is something that we need to talk about, because one of the most dangerous forms of white supremacist nationalism on the left today, 
is the animation of the working class along nationalist lines, right? And we hear this in refrains like, you know, quote unquote, taking care of ourselves before others, American jobs for Americans, um, or the idea of foreign workers are driving down wages. And I think this kind of call to protect our jobs from migrants not only presupposes that migrants are not also part of the working class, when in fact they are, um, and often, of course, at the forefront of, of working class struggles, um, but also it actively pits workers against each other, right? Like migrant workers are not the ones who are suppressing wages. It's the bosses and the borders that are doing that work. Um, and so this kind of nationalism may seem progressive, but it's really reactionary. It's, it's a ruling class kind of nationalism. And I think in our struggles against capitalism, we have to remember that the enemy arrives in a limousine and not on a boat, right? Like that's a really powerful slogan uh, that we've seen. And this kind of nationalist protectionism isn't new, but it's being reanimated, right? So in the early 1900s and early and late 1800s, it was uh, the kind of ways in which unions uh, really rallied against quote unquote Asian coolie labor. Um, and also, you know, this is controversial, but I'd be remiss in not mentioning it, uh, the ways in which Cesar Chavez, right, famed farm leader Cesar Chavez, uh, really uh, organized against undocumented and migrant workers and actually was involved in uh, a campaign against, an, of, a campaign of reporting undocumented workers to federal authorities, right? So for, for Cesar Chavez, undocumented workers were strike breakers, right? Um, but I think, you know, these kinds of uh, these kinds of calls uh, to deport or to not allow migrant workers, they're not only immoral, <laughs> which they are, they're immoral, but they're also strategically flawed because they don't understand that the border is a method for capital, right? The border is not going to protect us against capitalist globalization. And I think that's where unions uh, or many unions have got it wrong, right? So when they're saying keep jobs out of the hands of foreign workers as a defense against neoliberal globalization, they're not seeing the ways in which capital actually requires the border to produce immobilized labor. Um, and you know, I think this is something that we need to be really cautious about. Um, this is something that's taking hold in Canada and the United States. It's kind of, you know, it's 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 um, it's one of the impacts of austerity <laughs> and that kind of scarcity and protectionist uh, logic. It's also taking hold in the UK. So in the UK, in response to um, a pro-migration platform in the UK's Labour Party, there was the creation of a new uh, organization that calls itself Blue Labour, which organizes around the principle of nationalist socialism, right? So these are very worrying trends. Um, and I think the only way that we fight back against this kind of seemingly progressive, but really reactionary nationalism is to actually organize for immigration status and labor protection and living wages for all workers, right? To make the divisions created by the border obsolete. Uh, because otherwise, if we continue to, to create this division between you know, citizen, so-called citizen workers and, and migrant workers, that's really maintaining the international division of labor upon which capitalism relies. And it aligns, of course, as you said, with far right racism, right? It blunts class consciousness uh, through racism. And so I think, you know, that that is crucial. Um, I'll say briefly, because I know we're wrapping up for time, the other kinds of left wing nationalisms, or, you know, I don't know if left wing is a word because it's the appropriation of the left, uh, is, of course, um, really reactionary left-wing feminism. You know, the, the week that uh, Border and Rule, well, Border and Rule launched this week, it was published the same, uh, same day that Border and Rule released, another book was released um, that's kind of topped bestseller charts. And it's a book called, quote unquote, Prey, Immigration, Islam, and the Erosion of Women's Rights. And it's a bestseller on gender theory right now, right? And so, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to pollute the airwaves with this or the internet waves with this, but the premise of this book is, quote, why are so few people talking about the eruption of sexual violence and harassment in Europe cities? No one in a position of power wants to admit that the problem is linked to the arrival of several million migrants, most of them young men from Muslim majority countries, end quote, right? So this kind of reinvigorated anti-migrant, anti-black Islamophobic discourse is taking hold 
under the guise of feminism. And of course, we've also seen this in the white feminist savior missions uh, and, you know, laws banning the niqab or burqa across Europe and also in Canada. And so this kind of appropriation of gender and sexuality in the service of nationalist power is one that we have to also be um, really cautious about, right? And this has a capacious trajectory. This is not limited to this moment. We know that imperial feminism has justified military interventions to supposedly save women from patriarchy. Homo nationalism claims to liberate queers from supposedly sexually repressive cultures. Carceral feminism vindicates prison expansion under the guise of victims' rights. And also trans exclusionary feminism reduces gender to biological determinism, right? So there's many ways in which we need to be thoughtful about the appropriation of feminism in the service of racist nationalism. Um, and eco apartheid is it's a big one, but I think, you know, again, we need to eco apartheid is squarely um, you know, a fascist force, right? It's 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 a, a tool in the arsenal of, of white nationalism. But I think there's also liberals who are increasingly latching on to, uh, tr to variants of eco-fascism in progressive movements, right? And uh, we can't forget that in the 1990s and early 2000s, the Sierra Club was embroiled in these vicious debates about immigration and population control, where many Sierra Club members advocated for immigration restriction as a method of environmental protection, right? And so um, especially with, you know, the rise, of course, of the climate crisis and the warming of our planet, uh, I think we need to be really uh, cautious about and, you know, thoroughly reject any kind of eco-fascist tendency in environmental and progressive movements that takes up this kind of um, immigration restriction as a method of environmental protection, right? And, you know, one thing um, that's, that's worrying is... Uh, in, in France, um, Marine Le Pen, who's a far-right politician, she's been making inroads in some environmental movements in that country with her new kind of screed of, quote, borders are the environment's greatest ally. It is through them that we will save the planet, right? So, you know, these, these kinds of ways in which um, really racist discourses of eco-apartheid, of, of feminism, um, of class struggle are showing up um, at the expense of uh, of migrants, but you know, really at the expense of all racialized peoples, um, is absolutely something that that we need to be uh, that we need to be thinking about, and more importantly, we need to reject. Oh, there's so much <laughs> I wish I could say to that because our time is. All I'll say is just real quickly before I take a, a couple questions: is remember internationalism? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, that was that was yeah. really mean. That was something, you know, I'm just an old person now. Um, mm. And also, why why are all these reactionary organizations, people, you know, white supremacists, nationalists taking the color blue? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm a very <laughs> proud blues person myself. And I'm like just stealing. They just like took my blues and gone, you know, it's just so unfair. Um, OK, so let me get to a couple questions. Um, so there was a, I'm going to put two questions together because they're kind of relevant. I mean, people really did respond to uh, what you said about Na uh, NAFTA. And so one question is, can you explain more specifically uh, NAFTA's role really in the displacement of people? But then you also talked about 1994, it's another question, uh, being the critical year, of course, of the formation of the Zapatistas, the EZLN. So the question is, can you say more about the EZLN and other examples of resistance and the best way to support movements like these? So I'll just give you those two. Sure, <laughs> all these big questions. Um, and thank you again, LaShonda and Laverne for all your work interpreting. Thank you so much, um, so much appreciated. And I know I'm talking fast too, so thank you. Uh, and for the reminders to slow down. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, NAFTA is, you know, it's the world's largest uh, trade agreement. Um, and, you know, one thing is that I think we tend to think about trade agreements as like a new phenomenon, but uh, they really just perpetuate the old pattern uh, that the British East India Company used, which is to use trade to subordinate markets for the benefit of imperial ruling class interests, right? 
Um, and today there's, you know, over 400 trade agreements that were negotiated in the span of, of 10 years. Um, and with NAFTA, I mean, in brief, you know, what NAFTA did was really privatize national industries, um, deregulated the public sector in Mexico, and really protected corporate property rights, right, through what's called this clause called investor state arbitration, which basically means that companies can sue national economies if they don't make the profit that they thought that they were going to make. Um, natural resources are extracted, um, and state subsidies are removed. And so that's really uh, the staple of, of all trade agreements, um, and really was critical uh, to um, to the implementation of NAFTA. Um, the two particular things that I'll, I'll just say about NAFTA is that, you know, NAFTA removed Mexican state tariffs on subsidized U.S. meat and agricultural exports. So that ended up flooding the market uh, with genetically, mo genetically modified cash crops like corn, right? And that's what's like, which is why uh, to the EZLN, um, to the Zapatistas, uh, to the National Liberation Army, that is why corn is a symbol of the resistance, right? That is precisely why, is because the markets have been flooded with shitty GMO cash crops that are subsidized uh, by the United States, while maize and corn, which is sacred uh, in indigenous communities and that is central to indigenous food sovereignty, um, has been destroyed, right? So the decimation of thousands of varieties of, of native corn, um, across indigenous lands in what we know as Mexico. And that this is a form of genocide, right? This is a form of genocide. To enact violence on food sovereignty is a form of genocide. Um, and it disproportionately impacts indigenous women harvesters. And so that is why corn uh, is a symbol of Zapatista resistance. And at the same time, while Mexican tariffs had to be removed on subsidized US exports, uh, the Mexican government was forced to eliminate any price controls on uh, on corn or tortillas that were produced in Mexico, right? So you have this kind of flooding of the market phenomenon. Uh, the other key aspect of NAFTA was amendments to the Mexican constitution, including the abolition of Article 27. Now, Article 27 was enshrined in the Mexican constitution um, after the revolutionary 1917 constitution, right? So as, as part of, uh, of, of a victory of the revolution. And for decades had affirmed this, the, this national control over resources and protected communal land redistribution through ejidos. And so NAFTA forced opened these kind of communal, non-capitalist forms of social organization and land organization, the ways in which indigenous social organization held land in common, or peasant communities held land in common to fee simple private ownership, right? The, the, the typical capitalist model of, of private ownership. Um, and then later reforms even sanctioned land seizures for debt collection, coming back to Robin's point about debt. Um, and so, you know, indebted farmers lost their lands, including to US agribusinesses, to multinational corporations. And in 2014, it's estimated that as much as 20% of land in Mexico was designated for mining interests. 70% of which is owned by U.S. and Canadian mining giants, right? So this is um, the, the kind of cumulative effects of NAFTA led to a massive crisis of, of displacement, which included, you know, displaced farmers now working as farm workers in southern United States and all throughout the United States, and also an explosion in the maquiladora industry, right, which also saw a vast expansion of, you know, 80%. Uh, within the first five years of NAFTA. Um, and really, you know, here we saw the kind of growing feminization as well. Um, and that's one of the key features of, uh, of free trade agreements is mass dispossession. And it takes a particularly, gen it has a particularly gendered impact because the remo it distorts the social organization and the gender relations that, that um, especially indigenous and peasant communities have to the land, right? Those non-capitalist relations to the land. Um, and so that is precisely why the Zapatistas rose up uh, in national rebellion, in armed rebellion. Um, and, you know, when when NAFTA was signed, the day that it was signed, the Zapatistas said the agreement would be a death sentence to indigenous nations and indigenous communities in Mexico. And that is what happened. Uh, and after after NAFTA, um, you know, the, the kind of proportion of 
of migrants who are indigenous um, that are displaced and are, have now become migrants, right? Forcibly become migrants is 29%. Like that's, that's the most recent estimate. So um, in terms of um, the connections between uh, NAFTA and displacement and the impact on indigenous communities and border militarization, like the connections are, are seamless. Exactly, exactly. I mean, you saw, you, they saw it coming with the like the Caribbean Basin Initiative and all those other earlier free trade agreements. Okay, um, another question. We have time to, I'll just give you this one question, then we have one more and we'll end there. Um, the question is, begins, you know, can you talk about how an analysis in politics of indigenous sovereignty would instantiate collective self-determination without reproducing borders substantially, or sub, I'm sorry, subnationally, without reproducing borders subnationally? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, I should say that it's, uh, it's really difficult to speak on um, what form Indigenous sovereignty would take, because, you know, of course, I think one of the things that we have to be careful about is the idea of like a pan-Indigenous approach, right? Uh, indigenous communities and indigenous nations all have their own articulations um, of what indigenous self-determination looks like. Um, and here, of course, I'm also thinking about indigenous self-determination, not only in the context of settler colonial states uh, that I'm located on, like Canada, or where I assume most people are listening in from in the United States, but I'm thinking here of indigenous uh, sovereignty and self-determination globally, right? Thinking about what freedom means for Kashmir, thinking about what freedom means for Palestine, uh, thinking of what freedom means for Kurdistan, right? Thinking about, about many, many people um, for whom freedom is, uh, well, freedom is, is, is uh, the freedom dreams are still lingering, to quote Robin, uh, for, for all people and most people, but um, just to name a few. Um, but, and so I think, you know, in terms of, of, of uh, borders, I think what is important to remember about borders is borders are fundamentally a creation of the current state of colonial capitalism, right? <laughs> like we're not talking about borders as any kind of way in which people uh, choose to mark their presence or to understand their self-determination. So for example, um, you know, the Wet'suwet'en nation, a sovereign indigenous nation, who exactly one year ago today faced down the full might of the Canadian state in a highly militarized raid. When people enter into their nation, into their community, uh, they ask a series of questions, right? Um, which is, you know, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but they ask a series of questions, which is, why are you here? How will your presence benefit the community? And do you work for the state or industry, <laughs> right? And so, um, you know, I've often been asked, right, like, how do you as a no border activist justify uh, and how are you OK with and how do you support walking through that kind of border checkpoint? And I'm just like, that's laughable to call that a border checkpoint. <laughs> that's like, you know, that's offensive. Um, that's, you know, a nation who is expressing its self-determination and asking the very legitimate questions that we should all be asking when people enter into our community, right? Like, are you a cop? Do you work for the state? Do you work for industry? That's like a standard question for any social movement to be asking. Um, and, you know, what skills do you bring? How does your work benefit all of us and how can we benefit you? Um, that really is uh, the ways in which we create kinship. That's the ways in which we create social relations. And so I don't think um, accountability, you know, accountability is not carceral. Accountability is not the border. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, having utmost respect and understanding of Indigenous history and Indigenous laws and, indi and Indigenous jurisdiction as a form of self-determination um, doesn't necessarily mean we're reproducing the state. We're only reproducing the state if it takes the form of the state, right? But that uh, those aren't necessarily um, those those aren't um, those aren't necessary corollaries. When I think of indigenous self determination, I'm also thinking of non capitalist modes of production um, that we were talking about earlier. Thinking about expansive ways of thinking about kinship. 
Um, and so for me, they're, they're not uh, dichotomous and they're not antithetical to each other to think about a world without borders and to think about a world without private property and to think about a world with poli without police and prisons and military and sweatshops, to think about all of those uh, you know, that vision of abolition and decolonization and no borders, um, I think are necessarily interconnected and, and they're not in opposition to each other. Yeah, not only interconnected, but um, mutually constitutive mm -hmm. and necessary to be talked about together. I love the story you begin the book with about being on a radio show and the woman saying, you know, if you believe no one's illegal, then what about gentrifiers? <laughs> <laughs> well, how come they'll have the right to just go wherever they want to go? Yeah. It's hilarious, but it's really it's really an important, it kind of gets to the point you're just making about, you know, wh why, would, why would sovereign communities who have experienced centuries of genocide, displacement, dispossession, trust people who claim to be, you know, the authorities over them to just walk in? Like why, you know, so you got just a lot of changes that have to be made uh, before you could even think about like what is what is what does it mean to undo border imperialism and undo borders, but undo with that undo border thinking, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that's a lot of work that that you know your book really brings us to, and 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 you've been doing for so long. Okay, so let me. I have two questions here, um, and I'm trying to debate which one I'm going to ask because um, we only have time for one. Um, okay, I'm going to ask the, the difficult one. Okay, oh, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, it's, it's an interesting question, but one one person oh, asks, um, <laughs> who, who, who are the profiteers uh, from the so-called border industrial complex, and despite its importance, does the theor this theoretical framing, I guess, of the border industrial complex oversimplify political economic functions of bordering? And that question could come from a, a variety of different ideological positions. Uh, but I'm just curious, you know, your take on, on it. Yeah, I think, um, I think when we're talking about the border industrial complex, uh, I think two things that, that, I would suggest we keep in mind, you know, one is that absolutely there is a profit motive to the border industrial complex, just like there is a profit motive to the prison industrial complex, right? And that there are many, many companies, depending on, you know, which state you're looking at, whether it's the US or Europe or Canada, um, who are invested in expanding the border industrial complex because they get contracts from it, whether it's contracts <laughs> Uh, virtual surveillance, whether it's contracts for detention, right? So there's a profit motive. Um, however, similar to the arguments around the prison industrial complex, it's important not to reduce these forms of state violence um, to the profit motive alone, right? Um, and especially if we look at it globally, um, you know, the border industrial complex is, is, a, is, is sanctioned and authorized by the state. <laughs> um, it you know, it may be expanded as a result of the profit motive, um, but in many states, actually, the border apparatus is fully nationalized. <laughs> it doesn't have the same profit motive as, say, you know, the United States does uh, with mass private detention. Um, and so I think it's really important to always remember the centrality of state violence and that the state and capitalism are constitutive of each other. The state is the method through which capitalism expands. It's the method through which capitalism is grounded. Uh, it's the entire legal regime for capitalism is contained through the state. Um, and also that the state, you know, the border industrial complex that is intended to capture, to contain migrants and refugees, to also create pliable labor, to create the conditions of deportation and deportability, that is all a function of the state um, working in tandem with capitalism. And so I think it's important to, to hold both of those together um, and to not solely place the responsibility of the border industrial complex, like the prison industrial complex, solely on uh, um, on private corporations. Because even if you have a fully state-run border industrial complex, it is still violent. Well, I couldn't have said it better. Again, it's all here. 
in Border and Rule. Make sure you get the book today if you don't already have it. Send it to your friends. Support Haymarket. I want to thank you, Harsha thank Walia, you. for spending this time with with uh, I'll be honest with me <laughs> with you. and, and all and all the joy. other five hundred people on there. Um, but it's really been a great conversation. I learned so much from you, and I'm reading this book for the second time, uh, and and I can't wait to assign it to my class in the fall. Uh, and also, just you know, we just want to hold you up. All the activist work you're doing and all the struggles, uh, we want to hold that up. And again, thank you for that, and thank everyone else for showing up. Thank you, thank you all, and thank you for everyone listening in. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Haymarket. Thank you, Lashonda and Laverne. Thank you so yes. much. Yes, thank you, Lashonda and Laverne. Um, just you know, done amazing, amazing work, and I know it's very difficult. Uh, especially given the fact we always talk so fast. <laughs> anyway, enjoy everyone, and I will see everyone. And again, thanks a lot. Get the book. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you, everyone.